Welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. I'm your host, Byron Pace. It is the first show of 2021. Feels like a long time since we brought out a podcast, and I guess it is, because the last one went out just before Christmas. And uh, here we are now um, a little late on the 12th of January. Uh, But we're here, ready to roll for the rest of the year, every single week. Um, there seems to be so many things I want to tell you about before we get into the show, and what an amazing show this is going to be. Uh, so first up, uh, very importantly, our partners on Modern Huntsman, who I'm actually with a lot of the team uh, right now over in Montana as I'm recording this intro. That might be why you can hear a storm brewing outside through my mic, because it is uh, very windy and very snowy out here in Montana. Um, so I am I am isolating with... Editor in chief Tyler Sharp of Modern Huntsman. Uh, something very exciting. Um, I'm not actually quite sure if I'm supposed to tell you this uh, because it hasn't been released as I'm recording this intro, but I know that it's coming out in the next few days. We have signed, and by we, I mean myself, uh, which in terms of the Modern Huntsman team, I am the conservation editor. Tyler gave me that new title, that shiny new title for this uh, volume, volume six, and he is the editor in chief. We signed 20 copies of Volume 6 just a couple of days ago. And very, very soon, we're going to be announcing that the next 20 copies that are purchased of Volume 6 will have our signatures in it. So what to do is make sure that you are following Modern Huntsman on social media. Go and subscribe to their newsletter on the website, modernhuntsman.com. Go and follow them over on social, particularly Instagram, which is at Modern Huntsman. And uh, you will be the first to know when that eventually drops and then you have the chance for the normal price that the, the, the volume six is but if you're the first 20 uh, that order then you're going to get it might even be 22 or 24 even actually i'm not sure you're going to find out go and follow modern huntsman and uh you'll be in with a chance to purchase yourself a copy with our signatures inside of it Um, So that's pretty cool. And there's a lot of other really cool things coming out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, If you don't have your hands on volume six yet, go and check it out. There's some of the stories uh, have some details on the Modern Huntsman website. And we've been slowly putting out little snippets and teasers on the Modern Huntsman Instagram channel. It truly is a breathtaking volume. I mean, they've all been amazing. But this one, it's I'm so proud to be to be part of it. Uh, and I think what I'll be doing is I'll be recording some podcasts. Well, I'll certainly record one with Tyler because we're in the same house uh, and we're going to probably talk about uh, Volume 6 and what's, what's coming up in the future of Modern Huntsman. Um, so you'll get a little taster. He's been on the show before a, a number of times. So if you can't wait until I bring out a podcast with him, go back and look at the archive and find uh, – just look for uh, – search for Modern Huntsman or search for Tyler Sharp in the podcast and you should find it. Of course, I have to start the year thanking every single person who has gone over to Patreon and supported the show. You really do make these shows possible. Uh, It's uh, a lot more work than people think. And uh, your support, whether that be moral support or financial support, makes a huge difference. So first of all, thank you to everybody who already supports the show. And uh, I am going to start by mentioning all the top tier patrons, uh, which this week include Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of RDContracting.co.uk, Tom McCraith, James Benjamin Normandale, James Marchington, South Ayrshire Stalking, the guys at South Ayrshire Stalking, Josh Starling, Thomas Cameron, Mark Zabrowski, and Galax Clothing. Uh, it is blows my mind that so many of you are top tier, but every... Every dollar that is supported on the Patreon uh, page really, really, really helps. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash Byron Pace and uh, you can go and have a look at uh, look at the tiers. Now, I've actually just done something recently. If you don't want to sign up to a Patreon account so that you can support the show, much easier than that. Uh, just head over to – or maybe you just want to make a, a one-off donation to help me make these shows. Head over to byronpace.com. Uh, or byronpace.co.uk. It takes you to the same place. And uh, click the podcast tab at the top and the podcast that you listen to. And there's a, just a donate button now. 
So you can just hit the donate button. Um, it's through PayPal, but you can pay with a card, and you can just make a one-off donation, and it will uh, it'll really help. Uh, the way that we like to frame it is that for the price of a cup of coffee, you can help make this show possible. Simple as that. And uh, if you if that's something that you can't do for whatever reason, then the other way that you can show your love and really really support the show is to head over wherever you listen to this show and rate and review it. That helps a tremendous amount. It makes it a recommended show when other people uh, are looking for, for similar shows. So head over, rate and review. And if you have any feedback, I, I love hearing feedback. It really kind of keeps me going. So you can email the show, podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. Okay, so to this week's show, and I speak to the fascinating Dr. Mark Schertz, who's a herpetologist. He has his own podcast. He does a lot of science communication. Uh, you will get all the tags and how to find him and where to listen, uh, either right at the end of the show because he gives them to you, uh, or you can just look at the show notes, and it is there as well. Uh, you may have even seen in the last couple of days from when this podcast goes out uh, pictures of like a fluorescent gecko. This really amazing discovery. Well, the team that he's involved in, that's the guy. And you're just about to hear from him and all the amazing work that he does on Madagascar. Uh, but there are, there are some things in this podcast that might seem like overly scientific and in-depth. I, I hope that we do a really good job, or mainly Mark, actually, not myself, of explaining what everything means. I'm basically probing his brain so that he can explain things to me so that I can understand them. But so much of this understanding, so we talk about why we actually name species. Like why is that important? What is taxonomic inflation? Like how does the evolution of species work? The issue of egos in science? Uh, whether we should be concentrating conservation on ecosystem levels or individual species, the importance of flagship species and the problems with habitat fragmentation. And it's all really important for the overall conversation around conservation. So although some elements of this might be deep dives, I think that you'll be able to take a lot out of it. And I don't know if you can hear that, but that is a dog crying because I had to shut one of the dogs in the room next door um, because he kept on bumping the mics. So it's a, a fascinating conversation with somebody who is incredibly knowledgeable on their subject. And I could have easily talked to Mark for another hour and a half. And with that said, and with the dog crying in the background, I'm going to leave you to it. Thank you so much for joining me once again. It's 2021. Let's hope vaccines roll out and we get some normality by the time we get to the ends of the uh, to the end of the year i really really appreciate every single one of you who listen it would mean a lot to me if you can recommend this show to just one other person because that really helps grow the listener base and for me that's what it's all about uh, it's engaging with people and hopefully bringing really interesting stories from fascinating people around the world so with that said i really hope that you enjoy this interview Mark, welcome to the show. Uh, where am I speaking to you from? Are you you're sat in Germany, are you? Yeah, I'm in Germany. So I am. I have just moved to Potsdam in uh, northern Germany. It's just outside Berlin, um, and I am going to start a new postdoc position here at the university in January. Oh, brilliant! But you're where are you from originally? Are you, are you uh, German? It's a very complicated story, and I'm sure your <laughs> listeners don't have time to hear it all. Uh, What's the truncated version? Well, um, <laughs> the truncated version is: I was born and spent most of my life in Basel, Switzerland. Okay. Um, but my parents are both English mothers, mother tongue speakers, and I am obviously an English mother tongue speaker. Um, and uh, yeah, so after. After growing up in Switzerland, I, I spent nine years living in America, which is why I've got something of an American twinge to my. You've got speaking. There's, there's a very international vibe going on. With yeah, your it, <laughs> they say that people that kids from international schools have this sort of characteristic English, and uh, yeah, I, I went to the international school there in Basel, um, and one can certainly hear it. Um, so, so what are you? Um, what's your postdoc going to be in now? Or what, do you, what is your focus? So my focus has always been, even when I started my bachelor's, so I did my bachelor in Edinburgh, and then I came to Germany for my master's and PhD. Oh, amazing. Near yeah. where I live. I'm uh, studying at Edinburgh right now, actually. Oh, most wonderful city in the world. Um, and I mean that very sincerely. I, I 
did my bachelor's it's, there. It's so a very it beautiful four city. Four years yeah. there. It is gorgeous. And the people are so nice and everything is just so... The only problem is uh, the insulation on the houses. But anyway, <laughs> um, so, so I did my, my bachelor's in zoology in Edinburgh. Um, but already when I was applying to that, I really, really wanted to study reptiles and amphibians in Madagascar. Because when I was about... Because it's a cool place? <laughs> yeah, well, I think when I was about eight years old, I sort of fell on my head and uh, my brain went, ah, oh, Madagascar, that's the place where we should spend all of our effort. And, um, and so that's what happened, basically. I, I, I dedicated most of my childhood to learning as much as I could about Madagascar. And, um, and somewhere along the way, I developed an entire obsession with uh, reptiles and amphibians. And so when I came to Edinburgh, I was really keen to do anything that I could in the direction of um, studying the herps, you know, the herpetofauna, reptiles and amphibians of Madagascar. Um, but as it turned out, it was quite difficult to do that. So I wound up doing all of that extramurally. Um, so I, I organized expeditions, which in the UK is a really supported and, and well-funded thing to do. It turns out in most other countries, that's not really the case. Um, and so I was able to go to Madagascar uh, three times between um, starting and ending my bachelor's. And so, uh, yeah, I made that my, my main research direction. And then I came to, to Germany to do my master's here. And uh, if I'm honest, the only reason I, I came here was so that I could work with the leaders in Malagasy herpetology, which are uh, Dr. Frank Glav, who is the curator of herpetology at the um, Bavarian State Collection of Zoology in Munich, and Professor Miguel Benzes, who is a professor of vertebrate zoology at the Technical University in Braunschweig. And so very quickly, I was able to work with them. And, and um, they base. I mean, getting to work with them put all of the I mean, it's not really wood on the fire at that point. It was some kind of extremely explosive um, <laughs> uh, fuel. And so... There was no I, going back at this point. For no, you. no. I, I mean, already in my childhood, I think the ship had sailed. Um, and, I mean, and it's, so, it's, it's a brilliant place to be enthused by because there's so many endemic species there. Exactly. So, so I mean, you, you can easily fall in love with the animals. And, you know, I interact with people every day who just think that, you know, chameleons are the most wonderful things in the world. Or Europlatus, these leaf-tailed geckos are spectacular, of course. And so it gets people excited about it, even without sort of understanding the underlying thing, which, which you get to know much better when you start researching it, which is that, Madagascar is just a place where evolution was handed an open and and undetermined platter and then was like, ah, well, we can now do all kinds of weird stuff that we couldn't do in other settings, uh, mostly because it was already – so it's about the size of Germany or France or, you know, it's about the size of California for the American listeners, three times the size of the UK, massive island. And um, – it was wiped essentially clean by the KPG extinction event. So that the massive uh, um, uh, asteroid that, of course, meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs, Madagascar was also already isolated by the time that happened. And so it was essentially clean slate. And now all this stuff could come to the island, which had all this open niche space and physical space, and make it home and do weird things. And then we have... And we think that maybe chameleons emerge there. Lemurs are spe special to there. Um, if you go to the plants, it's like 60 to 70% endemic at the family level. It's insane amounts of diversity on this one giant island. So if you're studying, if you're interested in evolution, um, or if you're interested in community ecology or assemblage ecology, then it's really sort of the dream place to work. Incredible. So, are you saying that the chameleons that we would, that people might be more common on the, the the continent of Africa, right, actually evolved originally in Madagascar? So we don't know that story uh, uh, fully. We have a, a paper that we're working on that basically. So, so there, there's a bit of a back and back and forth about this story. Uh, in the '90s, there was a paper that came out. It's like, ah, chameleons originated in Madagascar. Wow. Cool, cool result. And then in 2013, there was another paper that was by Crystal Tolley and, and colleagues um, that was published. And, and it basically said, ah, it actually looks like chameleons maybe emerged in Africa. 
And now our most latest, the, our latest results, which are not yet published, um, basically say we can't tell for sure because that those that deep part of the the chameleon evolutionary tree is not resolved. So we we don't know if it was emerging in Africa and then colonizing Madagascar and then coming back to Africa or emerging in Madagascar and then colonizing Africa somewhere along the way. But we do know for sure that there was like co-evolution going on. Um, not so much co-evolution as very weird, uh, back and forth dynamics. So like this, this question in a lot of Island bio, biogeography, when the Island is, um, is continental in nature. We have this fundamental question of, is it, have they emerged through vicariance, which is that the, the two land masses drifted apart basically, or have they emerged through dispersal? Did it get over there by sailing across the sea? And that's really just a question of timing. What we do know for sure in chameleons is that they're one of or the deepest group of chameleons, the oldest group of chameleons, are the teeny tiny chameleons in the genus Brachesia and their sister genus Pallion, which are not maybe what you might imagine as what a chameleon looks like. Um, and then Madagascar has a second group of chameleons that are not closely related to those what are called leaf chameleons um, that emerged, is much more closely related to the African chameleons. And we know that, you know, Madagascar has uh, uh, about a hundred species of chameleons, so about half of all chameleons. And so now we, we want to know the answer to the question, where is their origin? What, what is their, uh, the source of their diversity or where did they come from? And that question, because there are basically no fossils from within the last 65 million years on Madagascar is not an easy one to answer. Yeah, because we rely so much, or we have historically relied so much on the, the fossil record to determine this. Right. It was, so there's a partially this historical problem. We Historically, we would have relied very heavily on the fossil record. And then there's the problem that when you do the molecular phylogenetics, or in fact, phylogenomics, so massive data sets, you still can't answer the question because you don't get resolution at those really deep nodes where it would make a difference. So it might be that we, we have to wait until a few fossils come out. And um, and that hasn't been helped along by people uh, finding fossils that are too young and being like, oh, this helps us to answer the question. Well, it doesn't because they're too young. Or you find fossils that are in entirely different parts of the world where people go, ah, this looks like it's a chameleon. And then this is quite a famous story. Uh, this um, new paper that just came out in uh, in science now, I think it was, where they were like, ah, oh, that, that thing that we called a chameleon three years ago, it turns out that's an amphibian from a very weird group of amphibians. Uh, so the chameleon I mean, that, fossil that record happens is pretty quite, That happens quite a lot. Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I'm conscious of the fact that we just you just mentioned phylo, phylogenetics there, which um, and I'm thinking about the, sort of the, the level of scientific knowledge of the people who listen to this podcast. Oh, yeah, of so everyone is kind of they're absolutely intrigued and enthralled by it. That's I guess that's why they listen to all these amazing guests that I have on. But in terms of the actual uh, like scientific vocabulary and what that means, mm -hmm. there might be a, a little bit of back and forward where I just get you to expand on that in a in a in a way that's kind of reasonably understandable. So when yeah, you no talked problem. about phylogenetics there and we were talking about comparison of that to the fossil record, what are you actually talking about? So phylogenetics is, is basically tree building. If you want to know the, the family tree of any group of animals, you have to build a tree out of it. And, and we do that based um, on a combination of different things. Historically, this was done entirely based on features of the animals, their so-called morphology, and uh, nowadays we do it very dominantly based on genetic characteristics because, of course, everything inherits DNA from further up the tree, and so um, basically you can look at the shared genetic history and you can reconstruct a, a, a tree out of what those things are related to. The details are not really that important because it gets extremely complicated and then, yes. you know, we're, we're only, we're, we're not going to be here for, for the six hours that it requires to fully <laughs> <laughs> it. Um, but it, it, it allows us to get a good estimation of what's related to what and how closely. And then you can trace that further and further back. And eventually you can come to the conclusion that, you know, oh, these two things are uh, very closely related or these two things are very distantly related. 
And part of the problem when you're reconstructing trees like that is depending on what part of the genome you're looking at, which genes you're looking at, you might have uh, very quick evolving genes. So it's important to know that different parts of the genome evolve at different rates. And you can have bits of the genome that change very quickly, and they'll be really useful for the shallow level. They might differ between you and your grandfather or your great, 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 great grandfather. But when you start having... But we're still the same species. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But when you start having much further back, there's a point at which we get this phenomenon called saturation. And then those quickly evolving genes aren't informative anymore because the number of changes is so saturated that you can't see any differences anymore. And then you have to go to slower evolving genes, and those will have evolved at a rate that is approximately appropriate for answering those questions that you have. Now you get the problem that at some point there is an age where simply no genes are evolving slowly enough, or you can't find which ones are evolving at the appropriate rate in order to answer the question of which relationship is closest where. And that is the problem that leads to these these inconsistencies or these uncertainties in the phylogeny. And that's where a lot of molecular-based people would be like, okay, we'll stop. We can't get any further. But of course, historically, how this has always been done is to look at the, um, the, 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 the fossil record, because those questions that you can't necessarily answer with genetics, if there's a physical record of what happened around that time, you can answer those questions. And you're um, looking for variances in, in shape and form, just exactly. as you would if do you're looking for something that more looks like time. it's roughly intermediate between point A and point B, but it's more close to point B, you can be like, ah, okay, well, this probably split off at that time point and went its separate way and produced this fossil. And this other thing, therefore, is, is more closely related to a different group or whatever. Um, and at that point, we're, to, we're talking about... Fossils, you're screwed. <laughs> at that point, we're talking about uh, plus or minus tens of thousands of years, or maybe oh, millions. Oh, yeah, millions of years, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of this stuff is happening. Like, chameleons have, have probably emerged within the last uh, 30 to 60 million years, right? So we're, we're talking about time spans that are, you know, absolutely mind-boggling. Um, but, of course, in that time period, you know, basically all of modern mammals and all of modern uh, birds, which are, of course, dinosaurs, have emerged. So, um, you know, the things that have happened uh, in the time span in which chameleons have, you know, made just 100 species uh, in other groups of animals are, of course, basically incomparable. It's a, it's a very short time span in the history of the planet. Exactly. Yeah. yeah and then you're still trying to figure it out and you still don't have the right resolution to answer the question. Um, um, before we get into, because the the main focus of the the conversation was is <laughs> going to be this one, one paper that uh, was brought to my attention. This um, I'm going to butcher the title of your paper that we're actually going to talk about: barcode fishing for archival DNA from historical type material overcomes taxonomic hurdles, enabling the description of a new frog species. So that is what we're going to be talking about primarily. But before we get to that, just because you bring it up. And uh, you've been talking about this actually defining species with um, more modern techniques than we used historically, which, as you said, was mainly on morphological differences. Um, you know, much of the stuff when we when most people are thinking about, we're thinking of Darwin, and we're thinking of him describing different beak forms of, his, of finches, the, the famous Darwin finches. Some of the discussion around that, or some of the, the criticism around that, is that we've gone from uh, we've. No, I was going to say created. We haven't created. We we found so many more species in the last couple of decades as a result of improvements in science. At what point are those differences genetically between species not important for the conservation of those species? You know, when do you define that something as a species and something is just a slight variation of a species? Oh, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, we could get 100 scientists in a room and we could get them uh, to fight over this. You would not get a consensus with 100 scientists, <laughs> no. I tell you what. Um, uh, yeah. But it's a really fundamental and really important question that we... It is. Uh, we, I mean, we kind of need to work out what the answer to that is, but yeah, we have so, been discussing so, it for a long time. <laughs> exactly. I, I think that is a that is one of the, the fundamental questions that keeps people going to work every day. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's something that 
when you work on things like defining species and like uh, describing species, it's something you have to face all the time because you're constantly having to second guess yourself and say, are these things really species? Because if you don't second guess yourself, you wind up just doing what's called taxonomic inflation. So taxonomic inflation is basically naming things species without them actually being species. And people want to name species because it's cool to be able to find a new species. Yeah, exactly. There is an incentive there. It gives you some prestige. And I tell you what, in science, it's so easy for one person's entire life achievements to be neglected or forgotten. But in, in taxonomy, in the science of naming species, when you name a new species your name is permanently associated with the species that you have named. Okay, so any species that you describe, let's say, um, oh, what's a good example? So if you go to some of the the historical names, the really classical names, like Gulo Gulo, okay? So Gulo Gulo was, I believe, and let me just make sure that this is true, um, was originally described by Linnaeus, who is, of course, the father of modern-day taxonomy. Yeah, famous, yep. Exactly. So it was described in his Systema Naturae, this massive work in which he basically gave names to all the things. And that the official name of that species is not just Gulo Gulo. Sorry, it's the wolverine. I should be clear. The wolverine's oh, Latin name an is An amazing Gulo-Gulo. creature. Yes. So the Latin name is not just Gulo Gulo, but it is, in fact, Gulo Gulo, and then in parentheses, Linnaeus, 1758, because 1758 (laughs) is the work in which he published that name. Now, Mm -hmm. it's in brackets. This is very important, and people ignore this all the time. The reason it's in brackets is that it was not originally described in the genus Gulo. So in taxonomy, all all animals – so Linnaeus' idea was that all life on Earth should be placed into basically a binomial system where you have the genus, which is sort of an overarching category of similarity, and then the species, which is that specific species – He didn't really enter into any sort of mind exercises as to what was a species because he didn't think there were that many. And so he was like, all right, well, everybody knows what a species is. It wasn't really until... And this is why why we're so used to, or in sort of the more public domain, we're so used to seeing the Latin name describing a species as as two words. Exactly. Most people will see it as two words, just as you've described. Yeah, exactly. And and his idea was essentially that this is just a two-word system and there aren't that many. And so if I make lots and lots of them, um, things don't get too complicated. Well, it turns out that he had no notion of just how complicated life on Earth was. He just had these things that he'd been sent by various collectors from across Europe and across the world. And he was like, oh, I can place these all very nicely into this system. And then he created sort of a hierarchy of structure above the genus level. That also indicated something about how similar animals were. The key word here is similar, not how closely related. It wasn't until later that, you know, Darwin comes along and goes, ah, well, actually, these things that are more similar are also more closely related. And then you start to have the system where the name reflects something about the evolutionary history of the organisms. Right, mm-hmm. and so, this is why we've seen a lot of re- in more recent decades we've seen a lot of restructuring of this. Where well, actually that was yes. completely wrong because yes, it was similar. Like the, the one example exactly. that I can think of that I that I know of because I was reading about it recently is the anteaters in South America compared mm-hmm. to the the pangolin, uh, the African and Asian pangolins, which were kind of similar because they were armored anteaters, but actually so far apart. Not uh, related. Not closely are, related at all. <laughs> not, not at all. Pangolins were far more closely related to um, carnivores than they were exactly. to uh, the South American anteaters. But yeah. for a period of time, um, they thought that they were. And so they were named in that. And then there, there was a whole exactly. renaming process. And there's a whole, I mean, that's the only n- uh, example that I know quite clearly, but that happens all It happens the time. every day. Yeah. And, and, and part of that is the fact that um, there are these preconceptions that things that look similar must be closely related. But it turns out that evolution really likes the same solution to problems. And so there's this recent meme that's been going around, for example, that life on Earth has tried extremely hard 
to evolve a crab. And it has done it many, many, many different times so that there is, I believe the process is called cancerification, where organisms, various different uh, 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 organisms, crustaceans and non-crustaceans, have tried repeatedly to evolve something that most people would look at and go like, yeah, that's a crab. <laughs> yeah. Because, so, so, I mean, there are all kinds of examples. Hedgehogs have two other equivalents. The tenrex of Madagascar, which are much more closely related to elephants than they are to hed- hedgehogs. And the echidna in Australia, which is ostensibly similar to a hedgehog, is, you know, lays eggs. So very, very distantly related to hedgehogs, but ostensibly they have sort of arrived at very similar systems and, and solutions to these problems. So conversion evolution gets people extremely excited as well, of course. Um, yeah. Yeah, what is it environmentally that uh, – have, have we come to an answer as to what is it about living in the environment that crab species live that has guided evolution to create something that is just so similar? Oh, there are so there many answers to that question. To I mean, yeah. it depends on every system. If you go to the crabs, for example, you can easily imagine that having defensive mechanisms in the shapes of mm-hmm. claws and is a hard shell for protection. Because, yeah. Exactly. And you have all of the... So, in fact, much of this is based on logic. If you think about an animal that's trying to get through a loose, semi-sandy substrate, okay? And it's got these limbs. And the way that the animal is going to move if the body is of a certain proportions, is in this sinusoidal wave, so in sort of an up-down wave, right? But if you have limbs the whole time, initially they sort of help you to get that thing, but in fact you're just as efficient without the limbs. And so all of the animals that have tried that repeatedly, which includes both fish and various different reptile groups and amphibian groups, they've gone... I don't really need these limbs. And so they lose them because evolution is like, well, this is costing us energy. We don't need it to get where we're going. And therefore, bye-bye limbs. And once you've lost a limb, it's extremely difficult to get it back. And that's another one of the sort of principles of evolution is that it finds a solution and then it's sort of canalized along the, the route that it has taken there. And it can only do sort of alternative things, except in very rare exceptions in order to then get any further. And and so you have these weird sort of directions that evolution goes along the way. But if I may loop back to to the initial um, uh, thing that you asked about, sort of why people are interested in in answering uh, these questions about, or, or in describing species in the first place, the reason I mentioned Gulo Gulo um, is that, uh, you know, Linnaeus is permanently associated with that thing, and that gives the scientists, a lot of um, this feeling of permanence, which is, as I said, so fleeting within taxonomy. And so any species that there is described, everyone is going to be, to to feel sort of um, permanently associated with that species. And that sort of, um, I think, is a bit of an ego thing. Yeah, I was going to say, but it it kind of vindicates this entire lifetime of working in science in a way. It can, but I think it also, you know, it's something like you feel like you're really making a difference. And it is a hugely important thing for these species to have names in the first place, because if we want to manage their protection, it's very difficult to protect something you don't have a name for because you can't talk about it. You can't spread the news about some little frog in a rainforest somewhere if you're just like showing a picture of a frog and being like, this is the frog we want to protect. It doesn't have a name, but the forest will probably be gone before we get around to naming it anyway. And therefore, you know, please. (laughs) I mean, that that goes to, I mean, an extension of that question, which is that, with very limited resources and time and uh, rapid extinction around the planet as well as population declines that are not necessary that, that are not necessarily in species that are currently uh, being threatened with extinction or are on the IUCN red list is this a good place to spend a huge amount of resources and time when exactly the, your point that you just made there was that maybe by the time we actually work out how what the relationships are between all these species they're not going to exist anyway because we're not spending enough time uh, protecting the greater ecosystem that supports all these species. That's a great question. 
uh, the, the answer is, I think, very uncomfortable for a lot of people who think that they're making a difference by doing this. Um, because my answer to that question is that whole ecosystem conservation or at least whole habitat conservation, is the only solution to this problem. I agree. The thing is that if you're using flagship species, which is sort of a a, a key word in conservation ecology or, you know, all these these sciences that are focused on... Pulling um, the public along with you, something they could relate to and get their claws into. Yeah. So the panda bear is the the big example for WWF. Yeah. And and elephants and, you know, giraffe and whatever. All these big animals that everyone's like, oh, I want to protect those animals. Well, you can use those animals. So lemurs in Madagascar are the number one example. You can leverage lemurs to get money. And then you use that money to protect not just the lemurs, but everything associated with the lemurs. And so flagship species work. Um, but only work if you're not using the money that you use for those flagship species exclusively for like breeding facilities for them. So in my mind, the panda stuff, I mean, that's a very long conversation. Um, but I think that the, the, you know, a lot of the things that happened with pandas was dedicated to getting them to breed in captivity. Meanwhile, they were losing bamboo forests at unbelievable rates. And ultimately, they, they managed to um, remove pandas from the most threatened category on the IUCN red list. Um, but still, there was um, the biggest boon to the entire planet from that conservation work was through the protection of the ecosystem that the pandas inhabit. Um, so I would, in answer to your question, I would say, generally, the biggest thing that people can do um, is is to protect the whole ecosystem. Nevertheless, having understanding about, it's it's not just about protecting the animals. It's also understanding what was there, what is there, what does evolution have the potential to create, and how are things related to each other can answer all kinds of different questions about like biogeographic history. You can use... The, the, the way that animals are dispersed across a mountain chain to infer something about how old the mountains are. So you can use these things in all kinds of different contexts once you have sort of the taxonomy in place. But that, I think all of that goes back to your very first question that started this very long uh, semi-tangent, which is, what is a species? At what point do you protect <laughs> these stupid things? Um, and... And for that question, I can only tell you, it has been debated by some of, in my opinion, the, the greatest, greatest minds. minds. Yep. And um, I think we're close to a solution. So in 2007, well, really in, in I think, 1999, there were, or 1998, 1999, there were these papers by Kevin de Quiroz, um, who I believe is based at the Smithsonian Museum uh, in Washington, D.C., And basically, his argument was, we've had all of these debates, you know, since since Darwin, basically, since the idea of species and evolution, there have been all these debates about what a species is, when at the core, there basically is this central understanding of what a species is. And the answer to the question is basically, it's some kind of cohesive unit of uh, of animals that are exchanging some kind of genetic genetic information and are um, stable through at least some period of time, right? So very very hand wavy sort of answer to the question. But what an answer like that allows us to do is say, okay, so classically people are familiar with a few different species concepts. They say, oh yeah, the biological species concept means they must be able to exchange like to to reproduce together and produce fertile offspring if you don't have that they're not the they they are the same species if you do not have the ability to reproduce together they are two different species if they can reproduce together they are the same species okay but plants fall apart and bacteria you can't use that on bacteria and anything that's parthenogenic parthenogenetic so anything that basically reproduces without uh, any kind of genetic exchange. So there are geckos, for example, that can, um, they have entirely female species, they reproduce through parthenogenesis, which is um, uh, uh, asexual reproduction. Uh, 
There's a few okay. snakes as well, I think. Yeah, plenty of snakes can do this. Uh, yeah. Some monitor lizards as well. And the, the, the crazy thing is, when you have that, of course, no two individuals can exchange genetic material. They can't interbreed with each other. And therefore, every individual is a different species, which is a yeah. ludicrous <laughs> hypothesis. Right? So, so the, the biological species co- uh, concept falls apart. Right. And then you have all these other things like the morphological species concept or the the recognition species concept. The species must be able to recognize each other as conspecifics. Right. All of those things, they agree at the fundamental core, which is that it's some kind of cohesive uh, evolutionary unit and evolutionary is key there. Right. And so what what um, Kevin DeKiros did was he distilled that and said, okay, these are the things that we agree on. And on top of that, we have, instead of concepts, let's call them criteria. So you can have the biological species criterion, and it could be fulfilled or not fulfilled. And if it's fulfilled, then great. You have really strong evidence that these two things are two different species because they don't interbreed. But in something asexual, it's obviously not going to be fulfilled. And therefore, you can move on to some other criterion. And his concept was free of rank or order, and it basically said the more such criteria are satisfied by the the species that you're looking at, the stronger the evidence that these two things are different species. But even if only one of them is, is satisfied, you can still consider it a species as long as you're explicit about it. And for me, that entirely changed my way of thinking about it because it means that you can look at a a system and you can be like, okay, well, I don't have time to do the experiments to try and cross these two things to figure out if they could be uh, uh, genetically compatible with each other or, you know, see if they recognize each other. But what I can do is look at their genetics and I can say, ah, these things have lots of genetic time between them. They also are morphologically distinct. They sound different from each other. And therefore I have all of this evidence that accumulates that says these two lineages are two different species. And thus we have sort of solved the problem of what is a species by saying, eh, pretty much everything, as long as you can find the evidence for it. So um, does, does this all feed into defining an ev- evolutionary significant unit? Uh, kind of, because evolutionary significant unit has is is this concept basically that you have within your tree. Uh, so within your 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 basically your family tree, you have these um, units that are doing something different and are probably on their own sort of trajectory. That has been construed in many cases to be population level things. And in fact, it turns out for the most part is if you have the true continuum of things and if nothing were to ever go extinct, it would be extremely difficult to tell the difference between populations and species because it's a continuum. Um, and that's part of the problem, right? So, so Linnaeus had no notion that life was on a continuum, that that speciation is a continuum. So he was like, oh, I can put things very, very nicely into my boxes, which is something that taxonomists and biologists and humans in general like to organize things into very nice, neatly fitting boxes. And in Linnaeus' system, you have a small box and inside, and, and that box is inside another box, the genus box, and that box is inside a family box with other boxes. And it contains everything inside. Yeah, exactly. Each box so, contains everything in the smaller box below. It's a beautiful system. Except but nature doesn't quite work like that. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. So um, uh, that's the gist of the answer to the question. We try, when we're doing these things, to work with units that are robust. And when you get cases that are not robust, where you can't clearly say, ah, this satisfies this and this and this species criterion within this, what's called the unified species concept, then eh, we'll put it aside for now until we can get stronger evidence to accept or reject the hypothesis either way. And that, for the most part, is how I and my colleagues go about describing species now. Um, and it allows us to uh, accumulate evidence and fits very nicely into this other thing. Sorry, I'll try not to go on too long about this. No, no, this, this is can. all fascinating. I have, I, I, have, I have so many burning questions now from, from this. Uh, this but so please carry on. I'm going to yes. try and remember what I want to ask you. So the, the, I think the last point I'll make on this is we have at the same time since 2005 
there is this notion that not only are species, you know, does it help to define species in this way, but in fact, the entire science of taxonomy can be done in a way that is that sort of mirrors this approach, and it's called integrative taxonomy, where you take multiple lines of evidence and the congruence of those lines of evidence. If those, so let's say I look at the skeleton of a frog, and then I listen to its calls, and I look at its coloration, and I look at its sort of external morphology. And if three out of those four, or even just two out of those four, or all four say the same thing, then the integrative method says this is a robust and clear different species. And you can see sort of how the parallels between that system and so the integrative taxonomy and this unified species concept allow you to work in a very, very similar way and in a much more robust and hypothesis-based way than might historically have been the case based on people being like, oh, I think based on sort of what I can judge about these animals, they're two different species. Now we're taking very clear lines of evidence. We're being really explicit about the things that define the different species. And so in my opinion, the species descriptions that are being produced today are a world apart from the species descriptions that were produced back in, uh, you know, even in 1904, you know, these, these early, some, some of the descriptions of fish from, from the 1900s are, pretty embarrassing <laughs> just <laughs> uh and i mean not to mention the things that were produced in the 19th century i think there's there's just some bizarre stuff because people there are extremely good schools of taxonomy and extremely bad schools of taxonomy and some people have just been producing things that are completely unusable in their descriptions and it, it makes this sort of in, integrated approach makes intuitive sense because mm -hmm. from the outside, if you're just being presented with the information as you've just explained the systems, you would want to use as many lines of evidence as possible to define whatever the outcome is that you're looking for. So in, in this case, we're talking about defining a species. So it makes sense that we're looking at all of these lines of evidence, and some of these lines of evidence w didn't exist, like the genetics didn't exist of course. Uh, in, early, in early taxonomy. So we're mm -hmm. kind of building on the back of that. I th one thing I wanted to uh, just raise as, as a counter to a point that I, was, uh, that I brought up to you earlier about um, phylogenetics breaking down species into like these, uh, or, or I had said creating, but not creating, but sort of realizing all these species because of these very small genetic differences. But equally, the counter is also true because uh, what the one example I'm thinking of is tigers. There was a lot of tiger subspecies based on morphological differences. But once they actually started to run genetics on them, they realized, actually, these are just minor variations because of environmental differences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's another very, very important thing to take into account is that with your one set of genetics, and we know this especially well from plants, if you take two identical plants, so a, a plant that is, that is selfing, so it's producing only clones of itself, so these things are genetically identical, and you put them in two very different habitat conditions and you raise them, you will get two plants that are unrecognizable as being siblings. So tomatoes are, or tomatoes are extremely famous for this, that you can put one in a desert and raise it as a desert plant that doesn't need a lot of water, and you can put it in a sort of lush habitat and it will grow into an entirely different looking plant. And that's just because there is this thing called phenotypic flexibility uh, that allows a, a, an organism to do one thing with its genetics or another thing with its genetics based on the environment in which it's raised. Which is much, there's more plasticity in plants than in plants. Yes, significantly more. Else, yeah. but because they're, they're, they're static. They can't move from, apart from um, <laughs> seed dispersal. Yeah, yeah, and tumbleweeds. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the, there are exceptions. So there are some tadpoles, for example, some frogs, where if the tadpoles are raised in a high density of tadpoles, a certain fraction of them develop huge mandibles and start being cannibals. And Did the others that? stay small and get eaten by the cannibals. And so <laughs> you have within a, a species a strategy for survival when you're competing with your own species. And these are from the same clutch. Right, so uh, uh, so it's, these are it's just to, how much to, variability there can be. Just to 
uh, and you can absolutely correct me, but I'm, I'm just trying to explain this in a way that's, well, first of all, that I understand it, but also so that everyone understands it. So you're talking about, this is the same genetics. You're talking about tadpoles from the same clutch, but exactly because of the, the external clutch. forces, yes. they are um, developing differently. Exactly. Based on the external forces. Yes. Yeah. So, so you can think of it like locusts as well. So locusts have this sort of uh, 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 stable form that is, if they are at a low density, they all look like this sort of normal, small, grasshopper -y thing. If they start to high, have high-density things, and I believe it has something to do with the number of times that another leg rubs against their own leg, uh, a certain number of them, in fact, I think most of the population, will suddenly transition into the, um, the, the transitory or this, this dispersing locus that flies for, for massive distances and eats everything. And, and you get these enormous locust plagues as a result of this phenotypic flexibility associated with basically a glut of uh, available resources and high population density. If you don't have that population density, you will never get those massive, I believe this is the case, you never get those massive uh, dispersing locust swarms. Yeah, I think that there's been quite a lot of research on this recently, and it, it's particularly relevant because we saw so many big swarms this year and uh, and last year. Uh, oh yes, but, yeah, the it, plagues. It's have fascinating been crazy. how <laughs> there have been. Um, it, it's fascinating how the expression of well, it, 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 am I correct in saying that this is basically how um, the genes are being expressed? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's uh, exactly it's a genetic response essentially to uh, the events that are or or to the environment, right? So you have this stimulus. The stimulus induces probably an endocrine result. So something within the the the, the body is changing in terms of physiology, the availability of some kind of hormones. The hormones elicit genetic responses that then produce different proteins that change the shape of the body, and all of this stuff is available within the developmental or the genetic code of the animals. It's incredible. Now, I want to ask you one more thing before we eventually talk about barcode yeah. fishing, <laughs> which, is the, which, which was the original reason you and I got in contact. Yeah. Um, and it's just, just on the back of everything that we've just been talking about uh, in defining species. In terms of conservation, it is, it's more complicated than that again, though, because... It is not just about uh, protecting species. Sometimes we might have populations of animals which are the same species but are adapted for the environments that they live in to the point where there, there couldn't really be any crossover anymore. How important is that understanding as we're talking about conservation as a whole and ecosystem health and protecting ecosystems as a as an umbrella for all the species that live within them? Uh, yeah, so I mean, there is so ecological speciation goes a little bit in this direction. So ecological speciation is this concept that above all of the other factors that are driving two different species apart are adaptation to their local environments. Um, and that can happen entirely overlapping with each other. So you could have one thing that is uh, adapting to, uh, you know, let's say in an, in an orchard. If you have one orchard that has apple trees and cherry trees, and you have a fly or a wasp that decides to lay its eggs on the one tree or the other tree, even though their habitats are physically overlapping with each other, they can speciate because they only ever mate on those uh, fruits that are suited to their to their choices, and um, you can have these sort of ecological interactions that allow that to happen, as I say, sympatrically, or you can have it very far away from each other. So, in addition to ecological differences, you also have uh, this compounding effect of being separated by lots of distance, which prevents gene flow between these two different populations. Um, that, as a concept is hard it's hard to say how that feeds directly into conservation because i think it's um first of all it's not very well understood secondly we don't necessarily think it's that prevalent i mean my opinion is that it's probably a significant contributor to a lot of what's going on uh but it's not as um it's not like the dominant force in a lot of cases um but i would i would say that it it makes 
the loss of even small forest fragments particularly concerning because, or, you know, small habitat fragments. I, I always talk about forests as though forest is the only type of habitat that exists. But of course, the same is true of a small coral reef or a, a small bit of savanna that's otherwise surrounded by some kind of a brushland or whatever. Um, all of those things are somehow um, uh, precious in that they have a history. Now, if that history is very young, you might not have any have had any opportunity for something to specialize on that habitat, and therefore losing it might not be so so big a deal. But in all likelihood, any population within a, in, within a forest or, or or a piece of habitat that's been there for let's say a few generations, or especially a few dozen or hundreds of generations of any given animal or plant or other organism. There is a good chance for local adaptation to have occurred, and so you are losing something of that evolutionarily significant divergence every time you lose that piece of habitat. Now, that's not to say that we have to be like putting our foot down and saying no forest from tomorrow or no habitat from tomorrow can ever be destroyed uh, because we can't reconcile that with you know human beings that's just not possible we we need habitat to we you know we need land we need all those things very complicated conversation um but you still have this certain um um there are more significant and less significant units that you would lose in any case and if i'm choosing between a forest that has only been there for you know 30 years a secondary growth forest and i'm choosing between that and a primary forest that's been there for 200,000 years there's a very obvious choice there. Uh, so we can set priorities based on how much or, or what the probability is that things have sort of locally adapted um, when we're thinking about what kind of areas we're, we're deforesting or using for humans. I suppose as time goes on and our landscape, I mean, our landscapes are already incredibly fragmented around the mm. world, but as they become more fragmented, if we don't make sure that these uh, the reserves or protected areas are linked together better. I think I've mentioned this. I think on the podcast before, there was a, a paper out recently saying that I think only ten percent of protected areas were connected to any other protected area. Uh, this is going to become a, a problem, uh, an increasing problem, because Absolutely. you're going to have these isolated populations, yeah. which otherwise would have interacted, but now right. going forward just simply can't because there's no way for them to get to another discrete population. Yeah, habitat fragmentation is is one of the biggest problems I think facing most large organisms globally. Uh, you know, if your if your population if your organism is small enough, even a modest sized area of habitat can have a relatively large number of them as long as they can occur in a su sufficient de density, and so you might not be losing so much. But if you're talking about something like a tiger or an elephant. And it has to move between forest fragments or, or habitat fragments. It's going to really, really struggle. So this problem, of course, gets gets worse the larger the organism is. I don't know what the scaling rule is, but there must be one because um, maths is everywhere. Uh, but basically, there, there's always going to be some relationship between how big your organism is and how big a forest it needs in order to be uh, uh, sustainable. And there's this concept in conservation biology that's called extinction debt, which is that you can reduce an area of forest to a size that it cannot actually sustain all of the animals that are still existing within it, but you don't see them going until they have run out of their ability to maintain themselves, which could be hundreds of years. So you could reduce a population, let's say, of frogs that actually needs an area of 200 square kilometers. You could reduce it to a five square kilometer uh, area of forest. You could do your population surveys and be like, oh, it looks like it's pretty stable. It's probably fine. But you can come back in 10 or 20 years and the frogs are gone. And the reason the frogs are gone is that they didn't have the area they actually required in order for the population to be sustained in the area of forest. So you end up with genetic degradation and, and then eventually 
exactly genetic degradation or inability to find appropriate mates or what's very commonly the case in frogs that breed in streams is they require forest upstream and downstream because the tadpoles (sighs) get washed down and if there's no forest where they actually emerge of course there's no ability for them to replenish themselves and so they go extinct even though they're still mating in their original forest (laughs) and this is goes back to connectivity exactly and continuation of environments well, so that's why, this... why gallery forests, these forests along streams and rivers, can be extremely important for animals that are, that are related to those rivers because they might actually have a life cycle that requires them over their adult lives to migrate up the hill so they can reproduce and send their tadpoles down the stream. One of the things um, – <laughs> This I, I thought this was going to be um, a conversation that was going to be on one of the the short, just pure scientific podcasts that goes out on the sort of the interim weeks from my long form conversations. But uh, this has turned into a long conversation form... with me before. That's the <laughs> this has turned into the this has turned into a long form episode, which I am absolutely okay with because I could keep doing this. So I know I'm saying we're going to get to the paper we are, but the, you just brought up something else, which um, is something I'd been reading about recently. And to be honest, I hadn't even though this is an area that I kind of fill my life with and I'm fascinated by, it had only been brought to my attention recently, which was this defining edge species, which goes to something you were talking about earlier about um, species with uh, that have basically existed for a longer period of time and weighting them in terms of where should we put our investment in to protect. If you have this um, longer lineage, you have more genetic history of evolution and sh- so we should protect these species mm, over mm-hmm. and above stuff that has evolved exactly uh, in more recent time what do you and i don't know if i've done a particularly good job of explaining that but uh, maybe maybe you can elaborate on it and talk about how that came about and, and is it important what's your view on it on this edge yeah, so, definition so, of so the edge is edge is actually a uh, uh, um uh uh, not an acronym, but a uh, initialism. Um, no, it is an acronym because you say it out loud. Okay, so edge is an, is a, an acronym, um, and it means um, evolutionary distinct and evolutionarily. Uh, Nay, what is it? Wait one second. I'm trying. I can't remember. E D G E. So evolutionary distinct and globally endangered. Yep. Okay. So it uses so, the IUCN red list as part of the exactly. criteria, doesn't it? And so the idea is the older a lineage is. So let's say, for example, sharks, which are extremely, extremely, extremely old as a group. Um, And so if you were to take a shark and it doesn't have any close relatives alive today, then it is extremely evolutionarily distinct. Okay? So if you – or you take the, the platypus, another good example evolutionary extremely distinct because nothing alive today looks remotely like a platypus except a duck and a beaver and it's um, such a cool animal (laughs) such a weird animal uh exactly and so you have this evolutionary distinctness which is it says something about the the sort of history associated with that organism and the older the organism the more significant we might think it is to preserve its persistence because if you lose those really really old things you're losing such a chunk of history and so that's part of it and the other thing is globally endangered so how threatened is it do we put it in one of the non-threatened categories is at least concern well then it's not going to get on the list because at least concern animals are of least concern we don't care about them in terms of their they're not of a high priority to conserve because they're doing just fine as it is um of course most animals are not doing just fine as it is you know rats and raccoons and things they're doing just fine but most things are globally declining um if you're a generalist, you're okay. If you're any kind of specialist, exactly. you're totally screwed. And if you're commensal, if you like humans, you're going to be fine. Um, everything else is, is pretty doomed. Anyway, so <laughs> – and the edge concept takes together these two different pieces. It takes the evolutionary distinctness and it takes the global endangerment and it gives you a magic number through some kind of mathematical formula because, as I say, maths is everywhere. And uh, it, it gives you basically a priority – in terms of how much you need to protect this animal. So, for example, if you have a very weird snake, 
that lives in the north of Madagascar, and it's called Xenotyphlops. Um, it is not related to well, Xenotyphlops grandidieri. It is not closely related to any other snake, blind snake. And so it has a very high edge score because it doesn't have any close relatives. And it's only found in one tiny area on like two different beaches in northern Madagascar. And that puts it very high up the priority list in terms of animals that we want to protect under this edge concept. Now, that is partially a consequence of taxonomy, because it's the taxonomists who decide how many species there are. Uh, I mean, you know, biology really decides how many species there are, but the taxonomists are like, how many boxes they, they do we put this it. into? Yeah. Exactly. And so until relatively recently, there was a second species of Xenotyphlops, and only uh, in 2013 did it become... I think it was 2013, did it become clear that it's actually just one species. And in doing so, you basically double the edge score because that part of the evolutionary distinctness is also related to how many close relatives does it have. And if you go from two to one, you, as I say, double, basically, the score. And so um, uh, most of the things that are extremely endangered or are evolutionarily distinct, we have to take a very careful scrutiny of them under the taxonomic, uh, from the taxonomic point of view, and be like, nah, is this really so evolutionarily distinct? Um, which can be difficult, you know. Um, um, but it, yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting way to think about it. But again, I think it's something where they're basically choosing flagships, not for how cuddly or cute they look, but rather for how evolutionarily distinct they are. And yeah. in my view, that's a good thing because you get flagships that are not just lemurs and pandas and tigers. It gets away from the charismatic Exactly. Uh, and you get some more of the weird, the weirdos. Like, you know, I don't know if chimeras are on there, but they should be. Um, what is a chimera? Uh, ch chimera, sorry. The, 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 the very deep see um they look a little bit like sharks but are not really closely related to sharks they're extremely ancient group um and all kinds of of weird things there are some frogs on the list and so they um yeah there have been a series of papers uh related to the edge species um and setting global conservation priorities for them but as i say i i think the key here has to be in protecting the entire habitat and we are not going to get close enough to – we're not going to get to the point where protecting single species is going to make nearly as much of a difference as uh, protecting entire ecosystems. And Yeah, I, I suppose in terms of these, these ranking systems, whether it be the EDGE system or whether it be the IUC and Red List, mm -hmm. the reason – one of the reasons why we have to have them apart from – knowing where the issues uh, are arising with certain species and, and drivers that are causing their extinctions is because that we are in a place where we simply don't have enough resources to save everything. Right. right. Which is really what this, what this comes down to, because otherwise mm -hmm. there would be no need to rank it. You would just yeah. be, you would just make sure that everything was as protected as it, as it possibly could be, and we'd be, you know, reinstating landscapes. But as you alluded to earlier, you know, that, that's something that's just, it's physically not possible because we have uh, an increasing population heading towards nine billion people, and we need more land for for agriculture, and we need to harvest more uh, biomass out of the seas to feed people, and we are struggling with this this pool between. Uh, how, making sure that human populations survive and are healthy and protecting species. But then you also have this um, this link back that we rely on so many of the services, ecosystem services that are provided by the fact that you have biodiversity, right? which is the, the, um, the umbrella term for everything that we've been talking about. Exactly. And I, I think that this is, as you say, it's, it's, a, it's a way of dealing with a bad situation. You know, we're at the point where you literally cannot put out all of the fire. So you have to choose what you're going to save. And um, choosing based on how evolutionarily distinct something is, 
and roughly based on how important it might therefore be to its environment, which is something that those, it's the edge system conflates those two things, but it is sort of, they are kind of related to each other. Um, it, it allows us to set some kind of priorities. Um, I mean, that how being much, said, sorry, go on. No, I was going to say, I mean, just, just on the back of what you just said there, how much work, and I don't even know if there's actually a, a, even an answer to this, but how much work has gone into trying to understand the the importance of particular species, particularly those that are threatened, because those are the ones that we're putting money and effort into saving, in terms of their place in the greater ecosystem functioning? Mm. Because all, really, that is what we're we're talking about protecting here. As you said, like right at the start, that's where we need to be focusing our time and our effort and our money yeah. is protecting ecosystems. And to protect that, you have to protect how they actually function. And they function as a result of all of the species that are within them. So some, you would assume that some species are more important in terms of the functioning of those ecosystems than others. Oh, and I, so I, those I, that are least important are the ones that we could allow to disappear, which sounds terrible, but <laughs> being just look, just being very analytical about yeah, it, if I we mean, accept that we can't save everything. Some species are, uh, we could say, redundant. So it is possible if one species goes out locally to, for example, replace it with one that is filling the same niche elsewhere. We don't always know exactly what the result will be, um, and sometimes that can go disastrously wrong. But for the most part, there is this sort of basic core functionality that we want in the ecosystem. And if we can find something that does the trick, then maybe we can get it back. Um, I am unfortunately not the right person to ask that question uh, because I don't know, about, uh, don't know enough about these systems. But I think that there is, I mean, there are loads of examples of things where we're like, okay, well, we need a, a so let's bring back to Madagascar. Um, if I'm historically Madagascar had giant tortoises, okay. They, Madagascar today has four endemic giant tortoise, endemic tortoises, two of which are small and two of which are relatively large, but it used to have Aldabra shellis, which is the largest tortoise alive today. Um, or one of the largest tortoises alive today. Well, it turns out that the species that's on the Seychelles, uh, of which I can't remember the name right now, um, is basically the same species as used to be in Madagascar. And in Madagascar, there is the hypothesis that these giant tortoises, along with the giant lemurs that used to be there, may have been responsible for seed dispersal of all kinds of different plants. And since they went extinct around 2,000 years ago when humans showed up, uh, or between 2,000 and 6,000 years ago, around the time when humans showed up on Madagascar, that niche has been left empty, and you've seen a steady decline in forest as a result of the loss of those very large organisms, that megafauna. And so right now, as we speak, there is a population of Aldabra shellius that has been reintroduced in one small area of Madagascar that have just gotten breeding again. And so we're filling the niche through the species that maybe is very, very closely related to the species that was in Madagascar until 2,000 years ago, or maybe they went extinct actually later than that. I don't remember now, um, or more recently than that, I mean. But anyway, this niche that certainly is no longer filled is currently being, there's an active project to reintroduce these giant tortoises into the wild in Madagascar in order to recover that ecosystem loss. I don't know how widespread that kind of practice or that kind of understanding is for a lot of the species, for example, that are on the edge list. Um, but it's probably something along the lines or, or, or one of the primary targets that they hit when they're first looking into conserving these species is really how significant is it to protect this thing? Because if all of your environment is gone and you're just persisting, which happens yeah. <laughs> super easily for plants. Yeah then it doesn't make sense to protect you because we cannot recover that whole thing. Um, and the seed dispersals, that's a really common story oh, with, yeah. with species that are have either gone extinct or have diminished to such numbers now where they're, where they're not fulfilling that function anymore. I think the, the, one of the coolest examples 
if I'm not mistaken, is avocados and giant sloths, which mm, I've heard of a very this. long time ago. And uh, the only reason that we have avocados now is because humans like avocados, and so we plant them. But historically, they would have been eaten by giant sloths, which were like the size of a bear. And then they would have pooped them out, and that was your seed dispersal. But exactly. there's nothing that eats an avocado yeah. seed or yeah. pip now. Yeah, that's the so, story across the board. And, and, and globally, you know, the loss of megafauna – uh, within the last, let's say, 20,000 years that has happened globally has had really major repercussions that we haven't yet fully seen come to fruition because plants take a long time, time yeah. to die. <laughs> now, I, I want to get to the the, the the primary reason that we were we got on a call in the first place, but absolutely everything has been fascinating. I love this kind of conversation, and I think there's going to be a lot of people there's going to be some stuff in there that maybe hasn't fully been understood, but hopefully it's been intriguing enough that people yeah. want to dig into it more because uh, it's so important in terms of conservation, this conversation we've been having for the last hour really goes to the core of the future of conservation is understanding all these elements that we've just been bouncing back and forward. Yeah, and I, I must say that my my sort of social media strategy or, or or online presence strategy is based very heavily on that of Darren Nash, who is um, well known on Twitter at Tetsu, and he so his strategy for his podcast and most of the stuff that he's done blogging on various different news websites through through the years is basically to embrace jargon as something that. Um, is inevitable but allows people this sort of like it, it sort of pushes you to get more familiar with the thing so that's agree, why yeah. my strategy is very heavily based on i'm going to use the, the fancy words if you don't understand it just let me know <laughs> you yeah can and then it can be explained mark shirts on twitter and you could ask me if you don't understand something <laughs> i mean i i agree with that it, it came up recently i just wrote a, a piece for a publication that i write for on the resilience of biodiversity um, historically and going forward into the future and how we, how we preserve it. And I I had used some, I think I probably used phylogenetics in there and, and a couple of other terms, which unless this was an area that you were you read up on, you probably wouldn't know. There'd be no reason for you to right. come by some of those words. And so we put, I mean, I explained most of them within, but we also put a, a little glossary. So we built it into the design so that people could understand it. And one of the discussions when we were going through as the editorial team was, uh, came from one person saying, you know, I think we should move away from using words like that that people don't understand because it doesn't make it quite as readable. Down science helps, and I that's really exactly don't. what I said. I, I said I think that there is a way to, yeah, that people might not have that vocabulary, but I think there is a way to use it and yes. explain it so that people have a higher baseline to go forward yeah. and then go and you know understand the next thing. If we make continue. It accessible. Absolutely. Make mm -hmm. it accessible. And it's not about dumbing it down. It's just about explaining it in a way that people can understand it so that they can then take that knowledge forward. And I think it's a big mistake in in science communication is to, to shy away from it. Mm -hmm. um, e equally, don't try and make yourself sound so smart that nobody can right. using all these words right, that no right. one understands that nobody can engage with what you're presenting i mean that's the complete opposite i mean that's just that's just people being narcissistic yeah, yeah. <laughs> um which does happen quite a lot as of well in, in the sciences um it's like i i understand all these things you don't understand and uh, i'm just going to talk at you and you're still not going to understand yeah. that doesn't help anybody but no i'm totally with you there i think that um because i in, i mean that's the view I have because that's what I enjoy. You know, I come across things all the time in papers that I'm reading or your research that I'm doing. So I have no idea what that means. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I, I go and look it up. And it's such a resource I, now. And you can answer yeah, all these is. questions. It's and absolutely. all of these scientists are now accessible on social media or many of them. Yeah. And that makes and they, such a And they want to difference. engage, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, like like yourself, you know, you put up this, which we're going to talk about right now. You put up the, the this paper that you released on barcode fishing, and I thought, okay, I've just read some stuff on this fairly recently, but I don't fully understand it. I think this would be brilliant for my listeners of the podcast, and also selfishly, I want to learn a little bit more about it. Mm -hmm. So let me get you on. You reach straight back out, and uh, now here we are. We're having a conversation. So. To that, barcode <laughs> phishing. Now, barcode phishing or, um, you know, barcoding in inverted commas DNA uh -huh. is something that, that people may have seen in newspapers and in your kind of general media in the last, say, two years, 18 months. What on earth are we talking about? 
when we're talking barcoding DNA? Okay, so barcoding has been around since 2005. Um, the concept is basically there are core bits of DNA that most organisms on Earth share. In fact, the original concept was that there is this one bit of DNA that basically everything shares, at least all so-called metazoans, which are sort of complex animals, so complex life, uh, multicellular life. Um, and therefore, we can sequence this little bit of DNA, which is actually not part of your core, your nuclear DNA, but resides in the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Right? So, so inherited from the mother. Inherited matrilineally, exactly, from the mother. And uh, the advantage of this is each cell in your body has hundreds of mitochondria. And so your ratio of cells to mitochondria is massive. So there's much, much more of the mitochondrial DNA in your body than there is nuclear DNA, at least Which is shared, gene. nuclear DNA. Exactly. Shared so, from both parents. Uh, yes, exactly. So the, the nuclear DNA comes from both parents. Uh, the mitochondrial thing only comes, generally only comes from the mother. It's now been shown that it can very, very, very rarely come from the father too. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. But the, the, the general gist, I mean, very, very rarely, almost never. But still, sometimes um, the, the, <laughs> the joy of science. Exactly, there are always exceptions always to every rule. Except. That's the one <laughs> rule: is that there's always an exception. Um, anyway, so the idea with DNA barcoding is that you can just sequence this very small bit of DNA, and it contains a unique code, just like a barcode on your bag of crisps, that tells you what the animal is, what species it belongs to. The idea would be that it would be a gene that would evolve at roughly the same sp same rate that a certain percent of genetic difference between two different individuals indicates that they are species level distinct. Okay. okay? So if I take two humans, they will have an extremely small value in this in this uh, gene but if you sequence a human and a chimpanzee you'll have a much more reasonable um uh, percentage difference i don't know what it so is there's a, there's a threshold there's essentially a threshold problem species. being okay. different groups of animals and uh, different groups of organisms in general evolve at different rates across the genome they have different what are called substitution rates, the rate of replacement of one bit of DNA with a different letter in that particular location, a different amino acid in that particular location. And this okay. just happens with genetic mutation from generation exactly. to generation. Exactly. This is part of the genetic mutation process. It happens very, very slowly in most places in the genome. Exceptions are things like the, um, uh, the, the MHC genes, the genes that are responsible for your immune response. They evolve unbelievably quickly. And because they have to, to because, keep you alive. Exactly. They have to contend with all of the conflict that your body is encountering. And so your MHC genes are, are, are fast evolving. And things like your mitochondrial genes, because they're core, they are integral to all metazoan life on Earth and therefore shared in all metazoan life on Earth. And there are, I think, 14 genes. I can't remember now. I believe there are 14 genes that are in all of these organisms, or almost all of these organisms, and they chose one of those genes, which was the cytochrome oxidase 1 gene, which you do not know, need to know the function of, um, and said, this is the gene we're going to use in order to barcode species. And you can sequence lots and lots and lots of species, and you can look at them and tick their, the percentage difference between two things. So you basically align them so that they, you know, where there's a, an A in one species and an A in another species and another species and another species, so you get these DNA alignments. That's how we work with DNA sequences. We align them and then look for the number or percentage of differences. Of differences, yeah. And so the idea being you can now take your cytochrome oxidase 1 gene and you can build a stack of them and you can say, ah, okay, well, now we know that these two species or these, these two individuals because you're always working with individuals in, in uh, genetics, you're very rarely pooling things into a, an entire species. Um, so these two individuals belong to the same species because they have 0% difference in this gene. Or these two things belong to two different species because they have, let's say, 3% difference in this gene. So as I say, it turns out 
different organism groups, so for example, birds and frogs, have astronomically different values in terms of the rate of evolution, rate of change of their mitochondrial genes. So if we set a threshold in frogs, it will not work in birds and vice versa. Okay. And so you so have to set it at the tax, uh, you know, you at, have a, to at a level. At, at a certain level of similarity. Now, there is no hard and fast rule as to which level of similarity is required for that threshold. But generally, if we're working on a frog, we use a similar threshold, although we do know that within frogs, it can be very different too. Um, but, you know, if I'm working with a snake, I'll use a more reptile y sort of threshold. If I'm working with a lizard, uh, with a, sorry, snakes are lizards. Um, if I'm working with a frog, I use a more froggy sort of distinction. Um, now, different working groups also have different things, but we'll ignore that. So that is the barcode concept. Now, it turned out a little bit later, a few years later, that in frogs in particular, um, cytochrome oxidase 1 is pretty hard to get sequenced. There's something about it that doesn't like to be amplified. And so they looked at the, the mitochondrial genes of the frog and said, okay, we'll try a different one. So they used this other gene that's called 16S-RRNA. Um, is, is a, so it's a gene for a bit of the machinery that builds RNA within the, or builds DNA within the cells. And that gene happens to be very easy to sequence in frogs. And so in frogs, they chose this other barcode gene as the main one that would still be done. That didn't stop them from keeping doing cytochrome oxidase 1. They were eventually able to find a new way to get that one. But for the most part, we have sort of focused as frog people on sequencing 16S, as it's called. And so we have, in some different organisms, an entirely different gene that's being used for this barcoding method. The result of which is that you cannot necessarily say, okay, I'm going to use, uh, compare a frog with a bird because maybe they're using cytochrome oxidase in birds and using 16S in frogs. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so there's two different barcodes, basically. Exactly. So there are a series ones, of yeah. different barcodes that have been used over the years. And ultimately, a barcode is, it should really just be defined as any region of the DNA that is very um, strongly conserved in terms of its presence across a group of organisms that can be used for the sort of species level diagnostic. And so what happened by sort of by chance, not really by chance, but just because of the right person working on the right group, is that the entire amphibian fauna, and in fact, the entire reptilian fauna as well of Madagascar, was among the first in the world to receive this intense barcoding effort. So in 2009, there was a paper published by David Vietas et al. in the journal PNAS, which some people like to pronounce PNAS, which is very funny. Um, and uh, they published this paper that was called A Vast Underestimation of uh, uh, something, something, something. Wait a second. Vast I, under I, I know this paper. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have to get the title right. Vast Underestimation of Madagascar's Biodiversity, Evidenced by an Integrative Amphibian Inventory. Okay, so basically what they did is they sequenced all of the frogs that they had collected over many, many years working in Madagascar for these barcoding genes. And then very carefully, they said, ah, okay, so this species is this barcode. And they built a library of all of the existing frogs in Madagascar. And they had all of the existing names of frogs in Madagascar, which at the time was 250 frog species, which is a lot. But it turned out that Genetic barcodes, if you set a threshold of around 3%, uh, which seemed reasonable based on like closely related sister species, which are clearly distinct from each other based on their calls and they don't reproduce together, whatever. If you set that threshold, then that 250 that we have described is actually only about half of the entire diversity of all frogs in Madagascar. And that was a shock. That basically says all of the work that has been done since the 1850s in Madagascar, describing all of these frog species, 250, one of the most diverse frog faunas in the world, hasn't even hit half of all of the actual species of frogs that are in Madagascar. And the reason so, for that... So you had this, this library, 
and half of them didn't have names. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it turns out the reason for that is in part because uh, uh, physical – the scientists visiting the field – didn't become a thing until the 1990s. Most of it until then was collectors, European collectors, going to Madagascar, collecting things and sending them to taxonomists who were sitting mostly in Paris. The 1990s, that's just like the other exactly. day. Yes, the other day, basically, <laughs> people started going themselves, the, the, the taxonomists that's themselves crazy. started visiting. Um, it really started in, I should say, the 1980s, but very, very recently. And the... The result was this. Uh, sorry, I keep whacking my microphone because I gesticulate a lot when I'm speaking. Um, <laughs> the the result the enthusiasm. <laughs> I know it is. Um, the result of this was basically that there were all of these things that we knew about physically, but didn't necessarily have identification for. Or you know, these are all things that were already in museum collections. Better to say it that way. Okay, so we have no idea what's in the forest that hasn't been collected yet. But this is sitting in museum collections in Europe already were about 250 undescribed frog species. And that's bonkers. So over the last uh, – uh, since 2009, so over the, the last 11 years, the, taxon- the, the rate of species description, the taxonomic rate that is uh, uh, concerning Malagasy frogs has exploded. Um, we have described in that time 110 species of frogs. And I, so in 2009, I was just finishing high school. I didn't really know that all this stuff was going on. Um, But I got really heavily involved in this, of course, as soon as I started my master's. And in the last six years, I have described about 64 frog species. Wow. And so the, the taxonomic rate, because we now know, based on these DNA barcodes, we can be like, ah, okay, well, uh, this is a new species. It's genetically very, very distinct. And now we go and look in our with our integrative taxonomic approach, which we mentioned much earlier. We can now go look at these things and say, okay, what does it sound like? What does it look like? How does it differ in terms of measurement differences? How, what if I look at its skeleton? Do I find differences there? And because we know it from the genetics, basically, ahead of time, that these things are probably going to be distinct, we have a much higher chance of finding characters that actually do correlate with genetic populations. And so we have been able to – it makes the process of species description so much easier if you know sort of in advance. Now, all of that has built up to the point where, first of all, the rate of species description of Madagascar amphibians is probably the highest for one country in the world. There are very few other uh, competitors. Um, Also, because we have amazing colleagues. So uh, Miguel Vences and and Frank Glav, who I mentioned uh, at the start of the podcast, the reason I came to Germany, they, they wrote the field guides, the textbooks to doing, uh, or, you know, the, the main source of foundation of knowledge for all of this amphibian and reptile science in Madagascar. But we had uh, the, their predecessors were um, Rose. So <laughs> Rose Marie Antoinette Blomer Schlosser and Charles Blanc uh, were in the 1980s. They were doing some field stuff in Madagascar. And they were preceded by this guy called Jean Guibet, uh, who was also based in Paris. And today, not only do we have uh, Miguel Vences and Frank Glove, but we have a whole community of researchers dedicated to working on these animals. And I'm very, very happy to say that the proportion of Malagasy researchers has dramatically increased in that time since since the 1990s. So now we have really uh, amazing Malagasy colleagues, many of whom were actually did their PhDs in Germany. So they came here to work with Miguel Vences and Frank Love. And, and um, uh, some of them were also educated in America by the team of Chris Raxworthy and Ron Nussbaum, who also were working on, on these things. Um, so we have this awesome community that is also trying to fulfill a lot of its sort of obligation toward um, capacity building within the country, um, which is another thing, you know, we could talk about for hours, but it, it gives us the momentum now that we can move forward with the taxonomy of the country at a rate that we can 
try to reduce that that percentage, that 50% undescribed species, obviously we want to reduce to 0% undescribed species. So we have a full picture of what the evolutionary diversity of this island really is. And we can better protect it. The trouble yeah, is... Yeah, because that's ultimately... Sorry, no, carry on, carry on. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll pick up once you, <laughs> once you carry on your thought process. The trouble here. is... Every time we go back to Madagascar and do another expedition, we come back with new species. <laughs> so genuinely, when I first started my master's, there were, within the group of frogs that I started working on, which are narrow mouth frogs, uh, American listeners might know them from Gastrophryne, which is a, a frog that's very frequently found or is widespread across the United States, only found if you're turning over rocks on a regular basis. Um, and other people might know them for various different, like tomato frogs. The tomato frogs are um, uh, microhylids. They're actually from Madagascar too. So I started working on these narrow mouse frogs. And when I started working on them, I believe there were 30 undescribed species within the, no, that's wrong. That's an underestimate. I believe there were 60 undescribed species within the um, this subfamily that I was working on from Madagascar. And by the time we had, I had finished my PhD, we had described uh, 30, 40, 40 or so. Uh, there, there's a f- full list of these on my, on my website. I just can't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Um, we had described about 40 species, but there were 60 undescribed species still. Because <laughs> in the intervening time, we had found 40 new species, which is insane that you're finding vertebrates at a, a new species of vertebrates at that kind of rate is globally practically uh, unheard of. The only other places where you can really do that is in New Guinea um, and Borneo, possibly in some of those areas in um, uh, in Southeast Asia, Australasia. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so it's bonkers. And- it, it means that we have we're chasing a finished line that's constantly running away from us. Um, and you know my estimate for the number of frog species in Madagascar, which is maybe maybe a little generous, but I, I would think that we're going to get somewhere around 700 species of frogs in Madagascar by the time we're finished. We are currently today at 360. So there's a lot of work to do. Lot and to do. I, I, just to bring this back to sort of the middle of our conversation here as we kind of bring this to a close, all this phenomenal work that's going on from many people now, so much time, you know, so much resources going into. I mean, we're just talking about frogs here. <laughs> Never mind anything else. Mm-hmm. How is that work being translated into actually protecting these species? Now well, that's that a very tough that question. That's a because tough question. ultimately, and, and we kind of said this before, but what's the point? You know, what is the point of mm. all this if we're not doing it so that we can you know, keep them? So, um, it, it sort of boils down to a few different things. On the one hand, there is the fact that all of the people who are actively working on the amphibians in Madagascar, for example, are members of the IUCN Species Survival Commission uh, for the, am- the Amphibian Specialist Group, um, and specifically the amph- Amphibian Specialist Group for the Frogs of Madagascar. That means roughly that we sit down every few years and go through all of the species that have been described since the last um, uh, the last assessment, and we give them conservation assessments uh, under the formal IUCN protocols, which are complicated and pretty stupid, but they are the best that we've got. Um, I have written some papers about how stupid I find them, um, <laughs> and. Uh, I may so, have read them inadvertently. <laughs> so, so we contribute to these to the actual red listing of the species, and then on top of that, there are um, efforts currently in place to establish breeding colonies, breeding facilities for species that are heavily at threat. Of course, amphibians worldwide are highly threatened by this fungus called chytridium or called Batrachochytrium dendrobotitis. Um, it's devastating. That causes I mean, the mortality is so called high, isn't it? Chytridiomycosis, and it kills. It has driven many species to extinction. Um, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't be confident in being able to estimate it, but I think it's more than twenty species have been driven to extinction within the I last yeah, twenty years. It's, 
I think I read something the other day, and that was research in South America, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken, and it was 25 or 26 species that they know of. Yeah. And and that's not to mention, I mean, it was a serious problem in Australia. So the, the thing is, in Madagascar, uh, a few years ago, the first evidence of chytrid was found. Then there was a bit of a hullabaloo because not really entirely clear what's going on. There certainly have not been any mass mortalities, which was the big thing that happened in the US and in Central America. Um, so nobody has been finding dead frogs. So we don't know what the situation is with Kitcher in Madagascar, but that is being very closely monitored and studied. And then there are all kinds of other things that are happening. So promoting ecotourism is one way that you can actually sort of make a difference. I'm a bit skeptical about it, but um, it does allow people to have a better appreciation for Madagascar and its plight. Um, but on the other hand, it's kind of difficult because it drives a pretty toxic uh, uh, system. Um, but, the, you know, the biggest change, of course, has been um, the ratification of what was called the Durban, um, what was it called, the Durban Alliance or the, the Durban Plan. Um, basically, they decided that Madagascar would double its protected areas. And that was sort of in, in consultation, obviously, with various different uh, conservationists and started in 2007 um, and and was supposed to finish, I believe, by 2012. But they're still in the process of ratifying a lot of the new parks that were created. Um, so Madagascar has been doing a huge amount to already improve the situation that they have. But socioeconomically, Madagascar is in the top 50 poorest countries in the world. Um, Often it's in the top 20 poorest countries in the world. It is not doing well. The poverty level is extremely serious. And the world's poorest people depend extremely heavily on the ability to have um, subsistence agriculture, which in Madagascar usually means a, a practice called slash and burn. Slash and burn is where you cut down the forest and you set fire to what you've cut down. Um, it is not sustainable in any way, shape, or form, um, and means that in a few years, I think about three three years, you have to cut down another area the same size in order to expand, leaving behind an entirely uh, devoid landscape that, as far as we can tell, or as far as I'm aware, is almost impossible to put animals or, or in fact, forest, to, to reforest those things in any kind of reasonable way. There have been some efforts now with eucalyptus forest, which is not native to Madagascar and is a serious invasive in many places. But the big advantage is that eucalyptus can survive anywhere, and it stabilizes the soil, which is the big problem. The soil erodes like crazy. So one of the questions is, can you replace eucalyptus soil, uh, eucalyptus forest then slowly with true natural succession to bring back rainforest? And I don't know the answer to that question. Interesting. Yeah. Normally when we try and intervene like that, we screw it up. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, and I, but, I'm, but I'm very skeptical yeah. as to whether or not that's going to really make a difference. But, you know, it's, it's something that is, is being tried, um, obviously not actively by amphibian researchers or whatever. But I think this is all contributing to some extent to the bigger conservation picture of Madagascar and a global I- impression of how important Madagascar is as, as an island um, and, and, you know, as this place to study evolution. It's just unbelievable that we have the opportunity to study a place that has gone completely nuts. Um, the, Gala- the Galapagos of uh, Africa. Yeah, yeah. There's so one, one thing I just – you bring up here, and I, but I think it's really important just to highlight, is that it is true around the world that some of the most important places for um, – the prevalence of species and biodiversity mm. also correlate to the poorest places on the planet. Absolutely. And the places and that are most vulnerable to being absolutely taken advantage of by enormous uh, companies. Now, this hasn't yes. happened to such a degree in Madagascar, but if you but go Central and look Africa, at New Guinea and Central yeah. Africa, I mean, New Guinea is um, is just heartbreaking because the size of the, not sisal plantations, but the, the um, palm oil plantations that have been erected in what used to be rainforest, because that's the best place for it, 
um, is is as far as the eye can see. They're in Borneo, and and that's um, irrevocable damage that's being driven by people's need for and um, desire for things stabilized with palm oil. Yeah, and it, the question is, how do we? I mean, I see a lot of this is coming down to the fact that society globally hasn't yet been able to correctly value the services of nature to humanity. Because if we did, if we were able to correctly value them, then the alternative uses like palm oil, like you're describing there, mm. wouldn't happen because then the resources would flow to prevent that. Right. Yeah, it's I mean, a it's, it's so much of it is dependent on on um, the global economy, and uh, we have not really managed to make one. And and so the rich countries continue to rob the poor countries, and the poor countries stay poor, and the rich countries get richer. And um, yeah, it's very very depressing. But unfortunately, that's how it's all working right now. Mark, this has been an unexpected. <laughs> incredible conversation not that i didn't expect it to be an amazing conversation with you because i knew what i was getting into by reading your paper before but i didn't expect us to go and touch so many different really important elements of of modern day conservation uh, yeah, that we was, was a treat i wasn't quite ex <laughs> quite expecting uh, but um, very much welcome so thank you so much for the insight and and the education both to me and to everybody who's going to be listening it's been fantastic, and I, I would I would love to have you on again. Maybe we can we can we can dive in, take a deep dive into another topic at some point. Oh, in gladly, the future. that'd be gladly. fantastic. I mean, just, um, go on. I, I was just going to say, um, just tell everybody where they can follow you because you, we're having this conversation now as a as a, as a single conversation, but you're very active on Twitter and you have a website. Oh, yes. so where can people? <laughs> uh, follow your your work on a daily basis yeah so so um i am a social media addict uh unfortunately I hate it. <laughs> uh, it's the worst um but i yeah you can find me on on twitter at mark shirts m-a-r-k-s-c-h-e-r-z and in fact as i'm the only one uh, Mark Shirts. You can just Google me, and you'll find me all over the place. Uh, my website is markshirts.com. You can find my uh, my old Tumblr if you go looking for it. Markshirts.tumblr.com. I don't maintain that anymore, so not really doesn't really make any sense. I sell like pictures of frogs on uh, Redbubble. Um, oh, nice! Which you can also find at Mark Shirts. And I, so I run a podcast where you can listen to me babble on like this about herpetology for literal days of your life because our episodes <laughs> are on average three hours long um, that's amazing and so, you do it with some other people yeah yeah so i, I do it with uh with gabriel ugetto who is a scientific illustrator um just had some stuff published in national geographic and so he's an incredible scientific illustrator oh, amazing. and um and ethan kosak who is a, a comic artist and he was the illustrator for the Does It Fart books, which people might be familiar with. Um, I, I am not familiar. <laughs> so th those were by uh, Danny Rabiotti um, and Nick Caruso um, and various different – that's like a hive mind Twitter project. So Twitter is the place mostly that I am to be interacted with. You can find me on, on Facebook too, but I don't like Facebook or Instagram where I also am at Mark Shirts. Uh, or oh, yeah, I need, to, find, I need to follow you on, on Instagram. I uh, I didn't yeah, know you were on there. Mostly, mostly I just post pictures of my um, vivaria, my little pieces of rainforest that I try to keep at home, and various different frogs that we're describing, uh, which happens all the time. So I didn't mention the name of the podcast. The name of the podcast is Squamates Pod. Um, you can find it at squamatespod.com. S Q U A M A T E S P O D dot com. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's where we talk about, we, we try to talk about like the latest, uh, what are in my opinion, like the most exciting recent, um, uh, advances in the field of herpetology based on the most recent publications. And also we talk about, um, uh, like themed 
themed episodes and we do things where we focus especially on underrepresented minorities within herpetology, which until recently we've been focusing almost exclusively on women in herpetology. Uh, we're going to branch out soon into talking about more of this, you know, um, uh, underrepresented people and, and all kinds of different problems because we're basically, um, three white guys making a podcast and uh, talking about a field that has had historic uh, underrepresentation of people uh, cannot be done without mentioning the, the problems that we have and, and trying to work toward fixing them or at least, you know, bringing them up. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, I, when I started uh, interacting with you on Twitter, I didn't realize probably because I just wasn't paying attention that you had a podcast, but now I know what my binge is going to be. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's going to be a very long binge if they're yeah. three hours long. How I many mean, episodes do you have? Brace yourself for some really intense jargon. Um, the, the opening credits of the thing now are basically where the language is strong and the jargon is stronger. Um, <laughs> so, well, maybe I'll just come out smarter. Would you be more for that? <laughs> well, that's my hope. My hope is that we can, uh, by sort of talking about these things in a really intense way. I mean, Ethan keeps a lot of, uh, of herps at home but it's mostly an illustrator. So I always find it great to, to talk with because Gabriel Aguetto used to be a, uh, a herpetologist and he's not anymore. He's just an illustrator now. But Ethan is the reptile keeper and he sort of brings us back to the, you know, explaining terms that aren't necessarily clear to everyone that we're talking to. So it's a really great dynamic that I think we've got there. And um, we've had a so 2020 has just been rough and um so this year we're way behind in terms of episodes and that's mostly on my shoulders but we will be bringing the whole thing back and 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 getting back on board but until then we have i think 16 episodes which is cumulatively um probably more of your life than you want to spend listening to <laughs> and as you can tell from listening to this episode which we're now in one hour and 40 minutes we of talking, are it's amazing um, i talk a lot and long and so that's that's most of what the show is. It, it makes it makes my life easy because it's all interesting stuff and I, yeah. I don't need to do much interjecting. I'm just listening and learning. But Mark, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on today. It's been an incredible conversation. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And I, I look forward to following the work that you're doing um, on Twitter and on your website. Good. I'm glad. Thanks a lot. 